I went old this time with a book. Went about 250 years old and picked up some Gothic fiction. Oriental Gothic fiction. And uh, in this context, if you don't realize, Oriental means Middle East, not out to the Orient. Outdated of a term as that is, but this is anything if a PC book, or is it? I picked up a copy of Vatek. Vatek. But, but, I don't know. Pronunciation out of this as an English only is very hard. By William Beckford. Uh, at the high level, if you think you're picking this up, it's actually kind of an interesting read. I, I, it, if you're like me, you enjoy books that have uh, historical impact and cre uh, credentials, let's call it. Um, consider picking it up. Uh, it, it is, at a high level, it is uh, kind of this harrowing uh, merge between a morality tale and a horror show, uh, where it is about Bathetic, the ninth caliph, caliph of the race of the Abbasids, uh, was the son of uh, Adasim, the grandson of Harun al-Rashid, uh, from an early ascension of the throne, blah, 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 blah. He's the, you know, the supreme ruler, the holiest of holies uh, in uh, Iran, roughly. It wasn't called Iran at the time, of course. Uh, heck, this isn't even written uh, concurrently with the author, because this uh, he is like the third generation after the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, we're, we're talking like 1,000, give or you know, ballpark it over there. But it really doesn't matter because the there, there's nothing particularly time-sensitive about the story. It is very much a story of a incredibly wealthy and powerful man who uh, throws himself into hedonism and materialism and lust and desire for things, for knowledge, for power, uh, for anything he can can't have that's what he covets uh and the the story kicks off very early when a uh gyor that's a that's a turkish word it means infidel uh shows up and he's this pot-bellied bizarre almost crazy indian dude who shows up and gives vathak uh these incredible impossible treasures he has uh, notably uh, magic swords that will fight on their own. And they're inscribed with runes that uh, Vathic can't decipher. He can't understand these things, which hints at the the knowledge that this uh, Jyor uh, has that he won't give Vathic, which of course instigates he, his desires, his jealousy, uh, and it draws him into this infernal exchange uh, uh, basically with the devil. Uh, but the, the Indian is devilish, but he later in the story, the the plot becomes Vathek's march to the halls of Eblis, uh, to be enthroned, to have what what everything that can be denied in the mortal world that can be had in the life thereafter in these infernal halls of splendor and power and uh, the only problem is that you have to be evil to get there. Uh, there there's ups and downs, and I'd actually say it it hits the like the plot beats of progression. Very good, actually. If you, know, like, if you read this and pick it apart as like the actual plot structure, generally speaking, it actually knocks it out of the park, which is presumably one of the reasons that it got picked up by so many other people and cited as uh, inspirations. That's actually how I found out about Vathic, because uh, if you dig into some essays and interviews, people have actually pulled out the list of, say, H.P. Lovecraft's inspirations when uh, he went to start his writing in the pulp era. Uh, but it's not just Lovecraft, that's just how I heard about it. Uh, this story has uh, influenced a ton of people from circa 200 years ago, and then they in turn influenced other people. And it's just part of the literary canon. And I wonder if that's altogether natural. Honestly, I kind of liked it. It... The, the story itself is a little over 100 pages. Uh, the the language is uh, entrancing, beautiful. You'll get through the scenes. It is kind of, it does have that old problem of they don't do scene breaks or, cap or chapter breaks or anything. I, I think you're expected to just sit down in one sitting and read all 100 and something, 100, 
All right, all 94 pages of this, you're expected to just fly through in one sitting, maybe, because there, there's no breakpoints. Just something you deal with in old books. Uh, this is not 94 pages, though. Uh, this is the Oxford World's Classic edition. It opens with introductions. It opens with notes from the authors and the editors of, of explaining how they got the text and what they compiled and what they were comparing. Because this was actually, the book, the way this got published is almost more interesting than the book. Uh, it was, he was trying to get it translated from his native, from f the French that he wrote it into, into English, but he kept having this back and forth with his translator, a guy named Henley, if I can recall correctly. Samuel Henley. Uh, but they were going back and forth, back and forth, not really getting anywhere, until suddenly the guy just released it and unauthorized and then uh william beckford tried to reel it back in to get edits and revisions and to change the uh some references and plots and uh personally i think you can feel an editorial hand at several times uh there are some changes at the end where they're kind of retcons that in my opinion don't fit the tone of the story because uh, uh, Vathek has to commit horrible atrocities and crimes. Uh, for example, he, he has to sacrifice 50 children to the Jyor. But at the end of the book, it's just revealed that, oh, actually they were saved by this, you know, th this wonderful guy that saves children. They're, they're living happily ever after in childhood. Don't worry of your precious little sensibilities about that. Um, and you kind of ask the question of whether Beck, William Beckford wrote one thing and then said, well, if I want to get this out there, I have to make certain changes for it to be acceptable for, their, for this to not cause massive societal backlash on him. Uh, and I think that probably was a consideration because you'll find out that he actually had a number of scandals because he was sexual, apparently. Or at least that's what uh, Oxford World Classics w wants to focus on. Of uh, those kinds of indecencies, because uh, he, not to mention, he was the uh, heir of a massive Jamaican sugarcane plantation that led to him being as fabulously wealthy as the chief that he was writing about, almost. Uh, and that's how he managed to uh, go at, to Egypt uh, and live there for years and collect all these Persian manuscripts uh, and draw in all of these references and uh, allusions and poetry and uh, mythology and weave them into his story that he then brought back to Europe, essentially. Uh, it, it was all funded by his wealth. And so, like, it's just like red meat to an academic that wants to dig into literary history and project uh, political sensibilities into it. I, I watched a 40-minute lecture from... Uh, from a, a researcher on this. Like, this book genuinely can form the crux of an entire literary degree, almost. Once you start getting into every single reference, because uh, this go, they, if, if you really start digging into it and take the idea that uh, Beckford created nothing, these were this was just, like, a collection, like a mosaic of earlier things, uh, you can find a source for everything, like you're doing a uh, historical scavenger hunt. And clearly, Oxford has been paying people do, to do that for many years. And I don't think that's necessarily fair. Um, so, sure, maybe when you're talking about, like, Eblis, the fallen angel, which is a, uh Islamic Lucifer figure, essentially... You know, maybe maybe you are supposed to be pulling parallels to things like Paradise Lost and all that. Um, and, but is it unfair to say that he's making historical references or something? Or is that just a novelty? Or is that just showing how big your brain is? Uh, then the, uh, a lot of these, I, a lot of the Gothic side of this story is about the like the architect, the supernatural esque, the uh, these complexes and the palaces and the towers that are almost beyond human comprehension, the way they're written to be intentionally confusing and awe-inspiring. Uh, because that's uh, kind of part of the genre. It's because like, you, you want that effect on the reader where like people are getting pulled into cha hidden chambers within halls, within halls, within halls, 
where horrible uh, grotesqueries are uh, shown to them so that for the amusement of the cow uh, the caliph it, it creates this atmosphere that just enriches the the moral stakes of the story because like to go back to my earlier point this is a morality tale in a lot of ways that it's like it's trying to cover the entire spectrum of human desire going from all the material to uh all spiritual desires for it and it, it indulges the idea that uh to get the most possible out of the current world out of the the known world uh you know that that's the deal with the devil is you have to commit atrocities that cut you off from the divine and the the architecture the styling the uh the scope of the disasters and the, the reactions of people and all that creates the this oriental gothic uh, atmosphere which on its own i think is actually it makes for a very good read but maybe i'm just an uneducated rube because i haven't read almost any of the like three dozen manuscripts that uh oxford calls out in the explanatory notes back here of oh this came from this okay this came from this these ideas came from this area you should go read you know virgil and opus and you name it you know go start with the greeks maybe i should go start with this. It, it, it the reading this book was like peering into an entire area of literary uh culture that i've only brushed it against before and i do want to give it some respect for like the depth that is available out there and it probably is all good and interesting reading uh you almost are going to need multiple years to really consume it all, or at least enough to say to feel that you have like an appreciation for it, for how these things interact with each other and what's being built and what's being and do compares and contrasts and, and uh, how different uh, culture themes are being brought together. And I'm not sure I have that time because if, if I'm if I spend the next two years studying oriental gothic fiction i'd probably enjoy all the reading but then the only thing i could write would be oriental gothic fiction. i want to write like sci-fi and stuff um so I, i'm gonna have to play this carefully so I pro there, there's a lot of these books that are just part of the the western canon that are worth reading anyways so i'm probably gonna go dabble with those you know i'm gonna i am gonna go through virgil and stuff like that and go Go reread Homer. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with reading Paradise Lost. Uh, but maybe maybe the more esoteric stuff can uh, wait a little. I've got other desires and other interests, and I don't want to be like a university professor that is just trying to put, piece together how. Oh well, he clearly must have been guilty over the fact that he was profiting off of the the plantation slaves and he was you can see this reflected in the fact that the caliph uh, was exploiting his people for his money and wealth and his pursuit of the senses and hedonism and love and uh oh let's just completely ignore the fact that he has this devouring evil mother that has corrupted him with her foreign uh th you know religion to push him into this infernal domain for in eternal power as she sees it, never realizing that she's actually consigning herself, her son, and uh, the women he steals to eternal torment in hell. No, let's just ignore that. We got we got to talk about the fact that uh, he was projecting homosexuality. He was uh, because you know the the hero character is this fourteen year old boy that dresses in girls' clothes. If you read this book. I think you'll probably like it. It's not, it's not a hard read. Uh, it, it almost comes across as a fantasy because it just brings in all of the mythological creatures of the Near East. You know, the genies, the dives, the, the Pernies, or uh, the Seamer, the uh, the Medusa, and all that. There, there's literally dozens of which I probably only caught most of them. And of the ones I caught, I probably know modern interpretations of these mythological creatures. Uh, it, it's a, it does make for a good and fascinating read. Maybe skip 
the academic lectures trying to reinvent the wheel with reinterpreting this thing. Maybe just treat it as a one and done story, uh, and compare it to some other influences. I'll maybe I'll try and come back to how to build a uh, a reading list out of this. I don't know. Uh, let me know what you think of Gothic fiction in the comments below, because I am going to be getting into some of the older works soon. Uh, next few books are probably going to be some nonfiction. And uh, till then, please drop a like if you enjoyed this discussion, if I inspired you to go read some old-ass public domain work from written in Egypt before Napoleon conquered it. That's how old this is. Uh, and drop a subscribe if you can. I, I think I can give a better discussion than you know, an Oxford professor is currently able to give. Doubt me, go pull up their lecture videos and, then get, and you'll shake. But, till then, cheers.